behind and come home across the sea. When I think about all the countries, it's a wonder I live past 19. When I think about all the fuel I haul over the mountains so steep, it's a wonder. But it 
song back in January, a song that maybe you just heard, and uh, Tipper asked me if I would pipe up uh, a little bit about a dream that I had, which led to writing that song, and to just talk about the song, and I told her that I do so much typing and so much use of the computer as it is, that I, I guess I'd rather just talk about it, um, but be careful what you wish for, because it'll take a long time to kind of cover all that. Um, but anyway, in about the second or third week of January, one night really late down in the morning, maybe around 2.45, somewhere in there, um, I had a dream about my dad, and it was the second or third dream that I'd had, and um, thank, thank, thanks to the good Lord, all the dreams that I've had about him so far have been happy dreams, none of them have been sad. So in this dream, uh, there's a tent out in the woods. It's a large yellow tent um, about the size of most people's living room and it's open on the sides and from where I'm standing in the dream I can see into the tent. I'm maybe 25 yards away and there are some people outside the tent standing in a row and they're, they're handcuffed and inside the tent dad is standing and he is handcuffed and he has no shoes on which is really interesting. And he looked like he was in his 60s in this dream. And there's uh, some sort of law enforcement officer who's, who's walking back and forth in front of him, pacing back and forth, and seemingly prosecuting him, accusing him of things. And he uh, accuses him of having something on his gun which is illegal. And in the dream, I remember hearing what it was, and it was uh, an accessory that I've heard of before. It wasn't a silencer, it wasn't a, a bayonet, but it was something that you can attach to a gun. And according to this gentleman, that's illegal. And Dad says, uh, son, are you talking about the gas port? Because there's not one of those, whatever it was, he, he named it also, I can't remember, uh, on an M1 or on a brand. And I don't think he meant that to be a mocking statement, but in the dream when he said that, other people in the tent, who were almost like a jury or an audience, they all laughed. And that made uh, the person who was accusing Dad more angry. And he's uh, you know, still pacing back and forth in front of him. And about that time, there's a sound of an air raid siren that goes off, and then people just start to scatter. And he grabs Dad by the handcuffs and kind of, you know, yanks him out of the tent. Outside the tent, the other people who were in handcuffs are being put put down on the ground, kind of face first. Um, he spins Dad around and, and puts him down on the ground, and he has his billy club out like this, sort of against uh, Dad's ribs there, pushing him down on the ground. And as he does that, um, Dad takes his hands and puts puts his hands on the billy club and sort of slides himself out from under the fellow, and as he does that, almost in one motion, he reaches over the man, and the man, like most law enforcement, he's wearing a big utility belt, and Dad reaches over him and grabs a hold of his belt, and once he gets a hold of his belt, he pulls himself up on his back, and so then there he is on his back, and all kind of in one motion, they're down on the ground, Dad's on his back, he springs off of him, lands on his feet, and goes running, just sort of out of frame in my dream, running away uh, from that whole area, barefoot, into the woods. And as he's running away, I start to hear this banjo clucking, and I hear a man's voice singing, and I can't remember what he said, but he said something about, you know, uh, something that happened in his life, and then he says, it's a wonder that I lived past five. And the song, in my way of hearing it, it seemed like maybe it was in G to start off with, and maybe it went around the horn, as they say, into A, and then to D, the low chord, when it says, it's a wonder I live past five, sort of landing in that low chord on the word five. And then I'm about half awake, half asleep, and that was the end of the dream as far as any kind of visualization. But my mind picked up there, and it started to write just uh, consecutive verses that, that went up in chronical, chronological age, and uh, the verses in my head as I was hearing them, they all rhymed, <clears throat> and 
once when I was a lot younger and I used to write songs, I was about half awake and I had a, what I thought was a beautiful melody in my head and a great song. And I thought, when I get up, I'll write that down, I'll get the guitar, I'll figure this song out. And I didn't get up, and then by the time I did get up, it was gone. And Dad said he had experienced that, and then one of my nieces, Corey, one of the Presley girls, said she had experienced the same thing where she was hearing this song, and she thought, when I get up, I'll do something with that song, and then when she got up, it was gone. So this time I got up, it was 3 in the morning, and I went and sat down, and I I grabbed a little uh, notepad and started to write this song down. And I'll try to cut to these pages here. So here are the sheets that I wrote down that night uh, with the ideas for the song. Right here at the top of this page is, I guess you'd say, sort of a rhymed couplet that I decided not to use. It was just a potential rhyme for the song. And then below that is the first chorus about the high washing. Um, below that is a, a verse I decided not to use, and uh, there's, I believe, maybe the fourth verse. Um, there's an idea that I incorporated uh, in a much abbreviated, more abbreviated form. Uh, here on the, the back of the first page, uh, most of those ideas and verses found their way into the song. On the very back of the last page, uh, I had considered incorporating Psalms, uh, a verse from the 72, 72nd chapter of Psalms. I didn't use that, uh, but there are some ideas above that that did appear in the, the last chorus. I'm jumping over to the middle of the song, but here is a part about being at the top of this page about being split apart, and that's a reference to um, that comes from the middle of the song, as I said, and that's a reference to when Dad was about 41, uh, would have been 1980, I believe. He had open heart surgery and had either double or triple bypass, I can't recall um, which for sure. And the latter half of that verse says, uh, they always said that my heart was strong, now I know it's not the only one, and I tried to... Uh, communicate two meanings there. Um, one, now that he is gone on to another life, there may be things that he knows now that he didn't know then. And at the same time, that's also a reference to, um, a, lo a lot of you may know that I'm an avid tennis player. And um, there was a famous tennis player, Arthur Ashe, who was also a great humanitarian, who had heart surgery the same time that Dad had heart surgery. And you would think, okay, a, a world famous athlete, Arthur Ashe was actually ranked number five in the world at that time, versus uh, someone who cuts wood and drives a truck from Western North Carolina. Which of those two are going to get the better medical care? Arthur Ashe had his surgery, I believe, in maybe Houston or somewhere in Texas. Dad had his in Emory in Atlanta. And uh, Dad's surgery was a huge success, and his bypasses remained clear for decades. But unfortunately, Arthur Ashe uh, soon began to have heart problems not long after his heart surgery. It did not go well. And in the process, tragically, they contaminated him with HIV, with the HIV virus, uh, through some of the blood transfusions that they gave him. And that ended his life not long after that. So that's just another sort of crossroads in dad's life where things could have gone much differently and his his life could have ended much sooner but anyway those are the pages that i scribbled down i apologize for the the poor handwriting and, and most likely you're seeing spelling and grammar mistakes as well but those are the pages uh, but i have about one two three four pages worth and i don't know how many verses maybe eight or ten verses and um, some of these I kept and then some I cut and the song quickly started to be all about dad and different things that happened in his life and one thought that I've had since he went on to be with the Lord uh, it's been about two years ago um, is that yes you know I lost my father but think about all the times I could have lost him think about all the different times his life could have ended and that to me was a comforting thing 
and a thing where it focused me more on being thankful than on uh, sorrowful. And so uh, I wrote all that down, and then I just kind of put it away in a, in a guitar case. I mentioned it to my other niece not long after that, uh, in early February, and I mentioned it to a friend of mine who said he had had a dream about Dad. And both of them commented, oh, I can't wait to hear that song. And in the back of my mind, I thought, you may never hear the song. And it's such a hard thing to write a biographical song and squeeze all that information into a song. It's very much uh, likely to fail and just be a flop. But finally, uh, I started working with the song a little bit. And I was aided by a couple of lessons I'd learned from the Avid Brothers, kind of fellow North Carolinians. And they are contemporaries of mine. They look much younger, but they're about my age. And uh, I learned from them that it's okay to make the song uh, somewhat vague, and that can be a good thing because then it's open to everyone's interpretation and they can get different things out of it, different types of people can enjoy the song. And then I learned from them that it's okay for your song to be asymmetrical. It doesn't have to be the same number of beats and the same pattern. And if this song had been symmetrical, it would have been, gosh, 15, 20 minutes long. But as the song progresses, the structure gets more and more abbreviated. And in a lot of folk songs or folk tales, like uh, Barbara Allen, there are certain phrases that are repeated. So in this song, I did repeat certain phrases to begin with, like um, when I think about the such and such, it's a wonder I live past and then you put in the age. But after doing that about three times, I kind of realized the, the listener can assume that phrase and you can shorten it as you, as you go through the song. Uh, in these pages, there's a verse about uh, wandering out into the snow. When Dad was about two years old, he told me he got up one morning and he peed in the fire. I guess it was cold, he didn't want to go outside. And then he was afraid he would get a whipping while peeing in the fire, so he went out of the cabin, everybody's asleep, and he wandered away. And there were about three feet of snow on the ground. And a, a fellow by the name of, it's either John Harris or John Parrish, found him several miles away, brought him back, and uh, that, it just wasn't, it just wouldn't work for the song, but it's, it's an event that happened maybe one of those first times when his life could have ended uh, really quickly. Instead, I went with the next time, which when he was about three years old, they lived on the Hawshaw Farm. In fact, the gentleman I just mentioned, his grave can be found in the woods. There's a cemetery in the woods on the Hawshaw Farm, John Harris or Parrish. But anyway, they were, uh, my mom, I'm sorry, my dad, his mom and dad were crossing the, the Hawassi River in a boat, something they did probably every now and again in the wintertime. Dad was three, and for whatever reason, he dove into the river. Now, I've heard different versions of the story. I've never heard it from him, but from other people. In one version, he swam across the river, and when they got there in the boat, they spanked him. Another version that I've heard, he swam down the river, and his mom, not wanting to lose her firstborn, even though she can't swim, jumps in the water after him, and so then his dad, my papa, who can swim, also goes into the water, and they finally get up with him, get to the bank, and then they whip him. But the first verse of the song, when I think about the Hiawassee, is a reference to that, because he could have easily drowned. Apparently, he already knew how to swim, but still, to jump out as a three-year-old into the middle of the river in the wintertime, it's just a, it's a wonder, like the song says, that he didn't drown. Uh, and the song picks up from there other dangerous things like uh, being in the Marines and, and visiting so many different countries. Uh, he made about six amphibious landings. And even though he was never in any kind of direct con combat, uh, there's always the potential, as the song says, that uh, it was a lot of tense moments in the Cold War. And people around him, soldiers around him, did lose their lives. So that was another way his life could have ended. Um, just out of his teens. And then the song goes on to, you know, driving the truck. He did a lot of different dangerous work, uh, hauling tankers of, of fuel and hauling everything imaginable uh, all over the country. And, and so the song just progresses, you know, following that line of thought. 
And I tried to have everything that's in the song mean a couple of things at once. Um, for example, the part uh, in the verse about the truck driving says, in reference to how much fuel, enough to burn the county down. Now that's to indicate, of course, something highly flammable right behind him and the danger to himself. But for me, it was also a way of indicating responsibility. And there's several moments like that in the song that talk about having responsibility in your hands. Unfortunately, it seems like in today's society, there's so many people who've never really held any kind of responsibility in their hands, yet they stand at the ready to criticize and jump all over someone who, who does hold responsibility and makes a mistake. Um, especially the whole Facebook culture, it seems so popular to get on there and just uh, slander and criticize someone uh, when they stumble. So a lot of the things in the song, they mean two things at once. Um, after those verses comes a verse about being a carpenter and dad built who knows how many homes uh, through the southeast and he built a church, a beautiful church. He built a lot of homes in Ohio and uh, Detroit, that area. Uh, usually one a week there for, for a good long period while he worked there. And uh, that verse at the end talks about working from pipes. Uh, when Dad was 60s, in his 60s, he would walk across stud walls and things like that, which was not a wise thing to do. Uh, but he was, he was still very agile at that age. And so the verse is talking again about danger, but it's also again talking about responsibility. Uh, it says talking about falling from heights. So all those those metaphors to try to mean both things at once. Um, when you hear the recording, there's a bass key, the lowest key on the piano for G that sounds in between each verse. And I had heard when I was young <coughs> that in the, I guess, maybe the fifth or ninth symphony, I'm not sure. <coughs> the bass keys, you know, dum 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 dum, dum 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 dum. But that was to symbolize death knocking at the door. I thought with my bass key, I could symbolize God being present at each period and each moment throughout his life. Um, as the last chorus says, the Lord of love was with me through all I said and did do. Uh, so to me, that's what the bass key is symbolizing. Yep, God was there, God was there, God was there uh, throughout all this. Not in a sense to preach, but just in a sense to be thankful. Um, so that, that's a little bit about the song. I didn't write down exactly what I was going to say, and I know probably as soon as, as soon as I stop this video, I'll think about other things that I meant to say. Uh, hopefully at some point this will be available on iTunes as a single that people can download and also hopefully it will eventually be on a couple of CDs, an anniversary CD of the Blind Pig blog and another gospel CD. I still have enough material left to release probably one more gospel CD of me and dad and maybe this can appear on there as well. Uh, one other thing that I will share in the, the the camera may even cut off before I get finished. Uh, when it talks about the fool, don't blame God for the fool or the song that he sings, that has a double meaning. It's referencing me. I'm the fool. I'm the one with the feeble song off, offered up. Uh, also, my nephew and I, we're, we're big fans of the band called the Fleet Foxes. And there's a former member of that band called, he calls himself Father John Misty. And not long ago, I saw that he was going to be on Austin City Limits. I set the DVR to record it. A uh, very talented man, uh, so gifted. And his second song in that concert was a blasphemous song, in my opinion. And in the song, he blames God for the wrong things in this world. And he, in essence, says that when God returns, he's going to tell God off. And he says... Why do we need hell when there's so much misery here that you've created? I stopped that concert. I deleted it from my DVR and also canceled or, or deleted my Father John Misty Pandora channel that I've made. And so that particular verse about the fool, it is referencing me. It's also referencing 
Father John Misty and that outlook that he has. And I hope that he literally one day rewrites that song and changes the outlook that he has. Um, because I don't think, I could, I could be a horrible sinner, and I am a horrible sinner, but I could even be, uh, I could be tenfold more sinful and be forgiven. But I couldn't be forgiven with an attitude of rejection, which is what I heard in that song. So that's a little bit about where that verse came from. I had seen that concert just a week or two before having the dream and, and writing the song. Uh, and I thought, what a shame that here's this gentleman so gifted and has no idea maybe where his gifts emanated from and uh, doesn't see them as gifts. And as I said, I hate that. And I hope someday he'll, he'll change his outlook and literally rewrite that song. Dad has different things that he would say throughout uh, my lifetime that I thought were wise. And one thing he would say is the difference between me and Father John Misty there is we're both fools. The difference is maybe I know it and maybe he doesn't realize it. Uh, but that was just another meaning that's behind the song. And you don't have to think about these things when you listen to the song. As I said earlier, I want it to be open for anyone's interpretation. And as far as the biographical nature of the song, Dad's just one man, one good man. Uh, any, any man, woman who lives, you know, a long life can look back at those different moments where things could have gone very differently in their lives and they can be thankful. Um, so it's not, it's not meant to be a prideful thing like, oh, he's, he's the only one that this is true of. No, it's true of many, many people from all walks of life. It was just my way of taking those feelings of looking back in wonder, as the song says, at his life and the way he lived it and the way it ended uh, in a triumphant sense, at least in my interpretation of the way his life ended. And then as the, you know, the very end of the song says, the greatest wonder is that his eyes and my eyes will open again and life will continue even beyond that. But I hope you've enjoyed this or found some part of it interesting. I know I've been really long-winded. And thank you for watching. And thank you for um, reading The Blind Pig, for commenting, and for all your support for uh, Tipper and what she does, and for our music and our whole family. Thank you.